when my wife and I moved out here uh, from Huntington Beach back in the 80s, um, I didn't even know Miraloma existed. Um, we were looking for a house. She said, let's go look at some houses. There's some out there in Miraloma. And I'm like, is that in California? <laughs> uh, and then uh, she goes, well, I don't know, but there's a Calvary Chapel Miraloma there. I'm like, I should have known. They're everywhere. So we came out here, and we wound up buying a house and started attending here, and it was it was great because it was like, it was such a Christian thing because like we just had family, friends. We just instantly, it wasn't like we were alone out here, you know, and it was, and Reuben and Virginia um, uh, were part of that group, and Patty Weeks, who was here earlier, uh, was part of that. Um, but anyway, we had four boys, Reuben and Virginia, you know, and uh, so our boys play with their boys, and so we've known them for quite some time. Uh, I, um, my wife and I had homeschooled all our kids, and we uh, headed up a pretty large homeschool group here in the Inland Empire. And so when I was here at Miraloma, I, I did some teaching, and then I also did teaching through our homeschool group. and. When I ran into Reuben at a Starbucks one morning, and he was saying, "Yeah, I'm going to be on vacation. Do you still teach?" And I'm like, "Well, I haven't in a long time." But so I agreed I'd come over and help him out. Uh, you guys are so blessed to have Reuben because that guy really has a heart. He really loves you people, and and I know that um, he's very protective of this body. And I count it a privilege to be able to come and speak to you, and it shows uh, his trust in me. And I hope, you know, not to let him down in any way. So if this turns out to not be so good, don't tell him, you know. It's just <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so as you see, it's a biblical worldview. This is uh, um, something that is um, on my heart. I used to teach a worldview class to kids in our homeschool group, and uh, we... Whether you know it or not, you have a worldview. And it's, a, it's one of these things where you need to be aware of that. So um, we develop our worldviews. Um, we inherit primarily, mostly, if we have a worldview, you know, how do we get one? We, we kind of inherit them either from our uh, parents or our culture initially, then as we get older, we begin to ask other questions and try and figure out what's going on with the world. Usually starts, you know, if you have children and they come to you and say, you know, you know, why did grandpa die? Or why is the sky blue? Why is, you know, they're becoming more aware of their surroundings and, and the, asking the bigger questions or, you know, where do babies come from? And that's the one that scares the parents the most. It's like, you know, go ask mom. Um, are we... A, one of our sons, I don't know how the topic came up. I came home from work, and my wife was like, oh, you know, this is funny. It, somehow it came up, and he says, well, maybe it's time. And he probably heard something from his brothers. I don't know. But she said, maybe it's time that Dad sat with you and explained where babies come from and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, what if I don't want to know? Uh, <laughs> I mean, Legos, G.I. Joes, what more do you need, right? Uh, why spoil that? So anyway... But becoming more aware, kids, as you develop, begin to want to know, why am I here? What's going on? Do I have a purpose in life? You know, as we get older, we ask these questions. And how we answer them affects how we live. So that's what we're talking about, the worldview. The worldview, we, you may know you have one, you may not, but you've got one. And so you need one that works. So that's what this is kind of all about. So I want to read to you a, a definition of a worldview. Um, this is from um, a book called The Universe Next Door by James W. Sire. It's, a, it's basically comparing um, five major worldviews and what they, what they offer. So you can compare, contrast. And it's a pretty interesting book. Um, but this definition is, uh, we'll break it down a little bit, so don't get overwhelmed at first by it, but we'll break it down so that you have a better understanding. But <laughs> I 
I can't view my worldview without my glasses. Um, a worldview is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions, assumptions which may be true, partially true or entirely false, which we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, about the basic constitution of reality, and that provides the foundation on which we live, move, and have our being. So let me read it again, and I'll take out the parenthetical statement so that you can get more of the flow of what he's saying. So a worldview is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions which hold, which we hold about the basic constitution of reality and that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. Okay, so we, we, have, we develop a set of presuppositions or assumptions about how life is, how reality is. Okay, now those assumptions may be uh, partially true, may be entirely true, or somewhere in between. Um, that's what you need to find out as you go through life. You don't want to have a worldview that's based on a bunch of false assumptions. Uh, it could be disastrous. Uh, it's like uh, GPS. You know, there's, I read an article about uh, people, uh, death by GPS, people that go, you know, out of the urban area, go off into the wilderness somewhere. It's happened up in Death Valley. Uh, drive out there, and you're following your GPS, and the GPS doesn't work out there. You know, it's not... It, some of these remote areas, it's not complete. And they drive out, they get stuck out in the middle of nowhere, and then wind up dying. Well, you don't want your worldview to do that to you, so um, you need to get that squared away. Let me, you know, it's, so you have these presuppositions. So they may be true, they might be true, or um, entirely false. Then the other thing is, you know, you have these presuppositions or this worldview, and you, you either consciously or subconsciously hold to these things. So like I said, if you don't, you may not know you have a worldview. Um, and the other point is, we'll talk about later, is... Um, you hold that, you live according to that worldview, either consistently or inconsistently. Uh, that, that's a quality of a worldview that we're going to talk about. But the main thing that kind of gets us going is the big questions. You know, uh, why are we here? Where are we going? What are, you know, why, why is everything so messed up? What's wrong with the world? I know that um, I do computer program, uh, mainframe computers, and we run these big jobs at night, and sometimes they blow up, and I get called in the middle of the night, you have to fix them. And so we have a meeting in the morning with the manager, and, and we just discuss what happened, how we're going to, you know, how I fix it, or, you know, how's it, how can we make it better. Okay, but at the end of this meeting this last week, uh, one of the guys whips out his iPad, and he starts looking at the news. He's going, well, the... Malaysian airliner got shot down over eastern Ukraine. 298 people killed. And then it was then he was like, oh, and Israel it got ground troops going into to Gaza. And then there was a then a thing about this woman who had sent she just got convicted for sending envelopes with ricin in it to I think it was some politicians or something. And she got convicted and she was like and her response was, well, I'm not a bad person. I really didn't intend on hurting anybody. I wouldn't hurt anybody. And <laughs> I don't know. Do you see a disconnect there? I, I'm kind of seeing something wrong. Anyway, one of the people said, what, what is going on in this world? Okay, like, I want to scream out. I know, I know. But um, you had to get to work. So anyway... The big questions. I like the way in this book, um, it's called The Long Journey Home by Oz Guinness, uh, spelled O-S, not O-Z. And um, this is a great book if you, if you want to, you know, maybe you're still searching, or if you know somebody that's searching. Um, he is a very uh, easy-to-understand way to evaluate what worldviews are, are, are viable. 
really comes down to one, but then you kind of knew that. Um, I lost my, I need my glasses again. But I wanted to give, I like the way he talks about the big questions. Okay. He says, how do we unriddle the mystery of life and make the most of it? What does it mean to find ourselves guests on a tiny spinning blue ball in a vast universe? Is our sense of individual uniqueness backed by a guarantee, or are we only dust in the wind? What explains our grotesque human capacity for slaughtering our fellow human beings by day and listening to classical music in the evening? Is there any emergency number to call when we have vandalized our planet home like a drunken rock star on a hotel rampage? Why is birth the automatic qualification for death? How should we live knowing that we each owe death one life and nothing we can do will ransom us? What recourse do we have if we conclude that the world should have been otherwise? So we have these big questions. How do we answer that? Well, that's why you need to pick a good worldview. Um, there's all kinds of worldviews out there, and like I said, some we inherit some. So I mean, and there's worldviews within worldviews. So like you can have, you know, a Western, a Western worldview. We kind of would fit in there, and then North American worldview, and then it might be like a Southern California worldview. You know, we have a way of viewing things that's different than somebody on the East Coast. You know, so there's worldviews with within worldviews, but. The one that we need to have that, that supersedes all of that, really, is a biblical worldview. So what, what do we need? What, what, is, what makes a viable uh, worldview? And so I've put down, um, I think, five things that come to mind for me that I would expect and that what I do find in the Christian worldview. And the first one is, it answers the big questions, okay? Like um, who we are, how we got here, uh, what is our purpose, what is wrong? We all know that there's something wrong. And can it be fixed? And where am I going? Well, the Bible answers all of that just in the book of Genesis, the first three chapters. Uh, We know who we are. We are created in the image of God. We are human beings that have dignity because of that. And how did we get here? Well, again, that's answered by God is our creator. And what is our purpose? Our purpose is to please God and to do what he's called us to do. What is wrong? Well, we know that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There was the Adam and Eve sin. Sin entered the world. It's a, a sin-corrupted world now. And we'll talk, see how that comes out later in the worldview. But we know what happened. We also, you know, we ask the question, can it be fixed? Like Oz Guinness was saying, is 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 there no ransom? Well, yeah, there is. And even that's answered in, in Genesis. If you remember when he, when God was showing them out of the garden, kicking them out of the garden, they had covered themselves with leaves. So man's covering uh, for his sins, it was insufficient. So God killed innocent animals, took their skins and he gave them a covering. And this was a foretelling of the gospel, that the man cannot cover his own sins. Man-made religions, whatever, it's not going to work. It has to be provided by God. He will provide. By the shedding of innocent blood, he provides the covering you need. Remember in the temple, the, the, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. It had to come from God. 
So even there in Genesis, it gives us that um, glimpse of the gospel. And where am I going? Well, I don't know about you, but the Bible tells me, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going to be with God eventually. And um, so that one's answered. So we've got all these things that, are, that have come together. Uh, we're getting them answered out of the Bible. We don't have to worry about that. And so then what do we, what do we need next? What do we need next in a viable worldview is uh, it needs to embrace the truth. Now, I really want to spend a little time on this because the truth is really under attack now. And you probably, I don't know if you've experienced this, but talking to people and they find out you're a Christian and then they say something like, oh, well, that's, that's okay for you. That may be true for you, but that's not true for me. And we're, we don't really know how to address that. I mean, uh, we tend to be people who are realists and we think that true, like two plus two is four. I mean, really? Could there be another truth? Well, I guess Common Core has one. Um, but so it kind of throws us off because it's like, well, what do they mean by that? How can this be true and that be true? And um, But it turns out that it depends on the standard. If you believe in God, then you believe in objective truth. It's a universal truth. And all morals and values are based on a universal truth. That means if something is uh, a moral good, it, it doesn't depend on whether you th- believe it's a moral good or not. It is. It's objective. It's universal. If uh, what is it, uh, Yosemite, the cal- caldera up there in Yosemite? You know, if that thing pops and the whole world blows up, whatever, it, it won't matter. Whatever is morally good is morally good, whether we're here to acknowledge it or not. And that is because God um, sets the standard, but let me change that. You know, people say God sets the standard. It isn't that God sets the standard. He is the standard. And let me explain. Socrates had a little uh, discussion with a friend of his, Euthyphro, and he, he asked him, he says, well, do the gods say piety is holy because it is holy, or is it holy because the gods say it is? And what that boils down to in more modern terms is, is something good because God says it's good, or is it good by some higher standard and God is ascending to that higher standard and saying, okay, everybody, that's good, okay? Well, that puts us in a, in a hard, between a rock and a hard spot, really, because on the one hand, if something's good just because God, through his sovereign will and power, says it's good, well, then goodness is really arbitrary, isn't it? It's just whatever God says. He could have very well have said something else was good in its stead. The other aspect is then God isn't really all sovereign. If there's a, a higher standard that, than God that makes something good, then God isn't, you know, the ultimate. There's some other, something that's above him. Well, that's not good either for us as Christians. But I like uh, Greg Kolkel to the Stand to Reason um, ministry. Um, he says it's not that... That you're missing it. That it's not that. It's that goodness is the immutable part of God. It's His essence. It's His. Uh, it's in Him. It's part of Him. It's His character. So it's not Him saying something is good. It's good because it's in God. It's nothing He's ascending to. It's good because He is good. And there's no changing that. So there's your standard, okay? That makes it universal. That means, man, so morals, values, all these things are built against that standard. And whether we like it or not, that's the standard. I was 
earlier I, I used the example of, you know, we're, we decided we needed to build a building out here for storage or something, and, and we don't have a tape measure. So I said, well, look, you know, uh, I have a science background, so let's do a metric. Let's use metrics, because I think a meter's about this long. So we'll go out there, and I'll just measure, you know, and somebody, somebody says, well, <laughs> you nuts, a meter's bigger than that. A meter's like this. Okay, that's a meter. I go, no, 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 no. No, no, I really feel that a meter is more like this. Well, <coughs> there are standards. There's like, when I, in science, we used to refer to something as being the ANSI standard. If you got a beaker and it had, you know, 50 milliliters, it would say the ANSI standard, you know, so you knew that was measured against the standard. And ANSI means the American National Standards Institute. So you could take that beaker, theoretically, go to that institute, and they would have the standard beaker uh, or whatever is 50 milliliters poured in there. Yep, that's it. So the meter, I think it's actually a standards lab somewhere in Europe. Um, they have like, like a rod that's made of an um, alloy of like platinum and molybdenum. Anyway, it won't corrode, it won't, you know, deteriorate. And so basically you can go there and compare. So like you know, my friend and I, we hop on an airplane, fly over, you know, you know, would you like a drink? Well, I really can't hold the peanuts and, you know, I don't want to move my hands. You know, you fly over there and you go into the lab and you hold it up there and you go, yeah, you know, you're right. That is not a meter. So let's get the right one. So you hold your hands, fly back. Okay. And we got the meter. But anyway, the thing is we can tell because there's a standard to compare to. So, The other side of this is then, if we don't have God, we don't have that standard. That means truth, goodness, beauty, all of that becomes subjective. It's more of like, well, I want the meter to be this, okay? It, truth just becomes, it depends on the subject, the person. So that's subjective truth. What we get with God is objective truth. It's true for everybody. Every situation. You can't, it doesn't change. It's immutable. So if you, if for me to say to someone that abortion is wrong, that is an objective value. Because God cherishes life. And they say, how can you say that? What gives you the right? Well, because I'm created in the image of God. And, and that baby's created in the image of God, and I know I have no right to take that life. So I, have, I can say that because I believe in a God who is the standard of what goodness, truth, beauty, and all morality and values come off of that. Whereas the person who doesn't believe in God, they can change the truth to be whatever they want it to be. So that's subjective truth. And really what that does is that that reduces it to really, it's not truth that they're talking about. It's about preference. Because I can say, as an example, I could say, okay, mocha almond fudge ice cream is the best ice cream. That's the truth. There's no debate. Well, I'm sure someone in here has probably come up and say, yeah, no, 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 no. That may be true for you, but what's true for me is pralines and cream. Okay, the fight is on. All right, but what are we talking about? We're not talking about truth. We're talking about preferences, okay? So let's not get confused when people talk about what is true and what's not true. Um, a person that has diabetes says, uh, if I don't take my insulin, I'll go into diabetic shock. That's not a matter of preference. That's truth. Okay, so don't get sidetracked. Your worldview needs to embrace the truth, the real truth. It's how we connect and make sense of the real world. It's, you know, if I say there are people in this room, well, you know that that's true. I put the idea in your head, and that idea or that thought is, finds that there's a, a correspondence to what's actually there in the real world, what's actually there in the room. It's that relationship. It's called a correspondence theory. 
Why do we have to have a theory about truth? Everybody just, it used to be people just knew what it meant, <laughs> what's true. But nowadays, things come under attack. We have to redefine, make sure everybody understands definitions. Um, so, truth, very important. Don't get sidetracked by stuff like that. Um, okay, another aspect of a viable worldview is... Um, Oh, one more thing about subjective truth. Sorry, look at my notes. You can't build a society on subjective truths. The Greeks, the Romans tried it. You know, they all had their own, they, they made up their own gods. You know, Zeus, Apollo, Athena. And of course, from them, they would make up their own values, morals. And those societies crumbled because they couldn't bear the weight of a society because then people began to realize as things change, they would change the rules. They would say, oh, well, Zeus said this, but now he says this. And, uh, well, we know Zeus said that, but so-and-so says this. So it begins to crumble. People begin to see that it doesn't hold up. Okay? But if you have a God-centered society, and we're using the standard that, derive, that we derive from him, that is something you can build on. Because it's not up to us then. It's, up, it's what God says. Okay. The other, the other uh, part of a viable worldview would be understanding the nature of man. I think this is a big problem with a lot of worldviews. You know, that, well, people are basically good. I think you're going to get in a lot of trouble with that worldview, and I think we're seeing the results of that even in some of our foreign policy now. So we're just good to the bad guys. You know, they'll be good to us. And it doesn't translate. You know, the Bible tells us that in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And in Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we know that man is not basically good. Man is basically evil. And a man without God, be careful. Why does it tell us not to become unequally yoked? Because man is not basically good. You might wind up with some real issues. Um, no matter how good they may seem, remember their goodness is relative to their situation. <laughs> they <laughs> so, so understand the nature of man. Biblical worldview, we have a good understanding of the nature of man. Can, can the worldview be lived consistently? We, <laughs> we um, have examples of that through Paul the Apostle, the other apostles. Uh, they're martyrs, uh, missionaries, and people you even know, Reuben, whatever, we, li they, we have a worldview that you can live consistently within. We don't always do that. You know, Paul said that we battle with the flesh. It's, it's, uh, he says, I, I, I don't do that which I want to, but then what I don't do, that's what I do. I don't want to do, that's what I do. So there's this battle. We struggle, but the point is we can it can be lived consistently. Whereas other worldviews and some of the Eastern religions, it's like, they, you know, it's like the world's not really real until you steal their wallet. <laughs> I mean, it breaks down when it confronts the real world. And they're living in the real world, whether they like it or not. And so in a worldview where it's not accepting... Um, reality, then you can't live consistently within that. It's just what you wish for, what you like. It sounds good. It makes me feel good to believe that. And then the last one, which I throw in because of probably my science background, is, I, is this is part of science. It's called falsifiability. Um, Karl Popper was a, a highly regarded philosopher in the 20th century, and he lived at the time of of um, 
Freud and Karl Marx and Albert Einstein. And he said, well, you, you have these theories. You know, like Marx and, and Freud, they have these theories. But the problem with these theories is, is that once something doesn't quite fit with their theory, then they go through these ad hoc changes to say, well, that's because this. You know, like Marx would say, well, the, the capitalist, the man is holding the worker down and he's taking full advantage of him and, and so on and so forth. But then there would be, you know, press, it would come out in the press that uh, the working people were making more money now than they ever did and their, their, their lifestyles were better and, and so on and so forth. And Marx would, well, that's because the, you know, the man, the capitalist, the bourgeoisie, they've fooled them. They are just, they are manipulating it so that they feel like they're doing better, but actually it's, you know, and so he has to change it to fit. And Freud did the same thing with his um, theories. But Popper liked Einstein because Einstein would say, okay, this is my theory on this. If A and B um, do this, then I should expect to see C. If I don't see C, then A and B, that whole thing's out. Well, you like that. Matter of fact, I, I think there was one where he's talking about his theories of gravity, and there's a star that's on the other side of the sun at certain times. And he was saying, if, if my theories of gravity are true, when the star gets around to the other side of the sun and we look at it, we, we know where it's supposed to be. We know it's supposed to be here. But the light from that star is going to get bent by the gravitational forces of the sun. So even though we know that star is here, we're going to see it appear to be over here. It was basically a theory. Now, the thing was, it took a while because we didn't have all the technology to do that. And you had to be in the right place. I mean, these guys, they would pack up stuff and head to the deep jungles of South America, because you had to be, you know, like in an eclipse, they'll say you can only see it on the West Coast or you can only see it here. Well, that was the same kind of thing. So for years, they were trying to prove whether this was true or not, and it took some time, but eventually they had the technology and everything where they go, yeah, you know, he's right, because there's the star, there's where it is, but now we're seeing the lights over here, so it must be, you know, being deflected by the gravity so that's falsifiability. You know this is true because if that happens, it's true. But if that doesn't happen, then you know that's false. I think that's a good quality for anything, any theory, even a worldview. And if you're intellectually honest and you, you, can, you have your worldview and you look and you see that, well, this isn't matching up with reality here, uh, maybe you need to make some uh, adjustments, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I remember when I was reading that and I came across that, and I have a friend of mine that's a, um, a really smart guy, a Christian, and uh, so I was talking to him, and I was, I was like, I was reading this Karl Popper, and, and, you know, he's talking about falsifiability, and I said it occurred to me that, Okay, what about Christianity? What do we get from the Bible? Do we see any falsifiability in the scriptures? And he didn't even hesitate. He goes, well, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, you know, if Christ isn't risen, we are to be pitied, the most pitied of men, because we're still dead in our sins. So you see, Christianity is falsifiable. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we might as well just go home, unless you're here for the burritos, which I can understand. Also, in, in the Old Testament, what was it? He talked about the, how do you tell, uh, you know, there was a question about there was all these prophets, and God was saying, oh, hey, and, and yet prophets carried a lot of weight until they killed them. Um, he said, look, if somebody says they're a prophet and they're speaking for me, and whatever they see it doesn't come true, you don't need to fear these guys. As a matter of fact, take them out and stone them. So, I mean, the Bible uses that concept of falsifiability. So I think it's, a, it's something that's good. If you're intellectually honest 
and you think something's true, then try and think about what is it when it's false? What if this part isn't, then maybe this isn't true and you need to find something else. Um, I think, you know, there's theories today, like personally, like global warming is one of these that it's like, there's never, it's never wrong. It's like, you know, we're, we got global warming. That means that we're going to have the worst hurricane season ever. And the next year they hardly had any hurricanes. Well, that's because the polar, you know, the cold water is coming in and mixing with the atmosphere and it changed the whole dynamic. And so now, and that's why uh, global warming didn't give us all the hurricanes that went, oh, okay. So, but yeah, definitely the, the ice, it's melting. Oh, well, now it's like this, the ice is back, you know, 60%. And they're like, well, that's because. <laughs> so when you have a theory that's always changing to fit what they want, then you got to question that. And that's where um, there's a saying, I don't know if he actually said this or not, but it's attributed to Karl Popper, is that a theory that proves everything proves nothing. You know, if you don't know when it's wrong, then how do you know it's true? So anyway, what is going on in the world? And how can we take this? How do we take this knowledge of a worldview? Because what this is is a framework for us to build on. He said it's a foundation. We want to. We have something now where we can evaluate what's going on in the world. Like that person that I work with that was saying, you know, what is the world coming to? Okay, and we take... Our biblical worldview, it's like our glasses that we can look out and we focus. We can focus things. We know what's happening. So we see in the world now, we see a breakdown in just about every aspect. Um, personally, on a personal level, we see you know, promiscuity, selfishness, narcissism, uh, selfies, really? Okay. I mean, I understand. I mean, we have pictures of our family around the house, right? And we share those with family and friends. But I mean, really? I'm buying a potato. <laughs> that, that's worthy of going out on the internet. Um, the promiscuity. Um, irresponsibility. That's not my fault. Well, I didn't mean to hurt those people by sending rice into them or... You know, I don't know if you guys remember the, was it Richard Pryor? Who was the guy that used to say, the devil made me do that? No, it wasn't Richard Pryor. Right? Flip Wilson. Yes, very good. Yeah, my, my grandmother used to tell me about him. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so they're always, the blame's somebody else. You know, society, and, you know, I had a bad childhood. Yeah. And that may be true, but you're still responsible for your actions. Um, so on the personal level, then what about nationwide? What do we got nationally going on as far as that? I mean, we have social ills. We have school shootings. We have homosexual marriage. We have divorce. We have lawlessness and pedophilia, and, and the list goes on. There's a real breakdown going on. We have worldwide, we got wars, terrorism, famine, disease, just wanton killing. I mean, in Africa, they got these kids. They arm these little kids, 13 years old, and they're going off killing people in villages. I mean, it's insanity. How do we make sense of that? Well, the thing is, I can understand because of my biblical worldview. I feel sorry for the people that don't have a biblical worldview because it's got to be eating them up. Because not only does it not make any sense or whatever, they have no clue what is going on. It's like this disease that's just ravaging everybody and it's like there's no cure. Nobody knows what to do about it. So... I really pity a lot of the people that don't have the Bible and it can't make sense of this. So what is going on? What what has happened like with our country? 
And with us personally, let's start with personal because that affects what goes on in the nation. On a personal level, we talk about the good life. Well, maybe we don't, but hopefully we don't talk this way. But in our, in the um, people around us, society, the good life. Well, the good life is um, I get go party and I get drunk and I hook up with the women and I just do whatever I want to do. It's the good life, man, you know. But to our founding fathers, the good life was a life of ideal human functioning, life of intellectual and moral virtue. Wow, that's different. Because why? Why is that the good life? Because we have a standard, which is God, who has created us, and that gives us dignity, and we answer to him, and so the good life is me trying to be like him through Christ. That's the good life. I'm living... Well, okay, I'm speaking generally. Um, I'm trying to live a moral and virtuous life. We all are. That's the good life. And the, what's happiness then? Well, today, happiness is, you know, I um, get to do whatever I want. It's kind of the same thing. The good life is lumped in with that. Is I'm, uh, I get happy when I'm out with my buds and, and we go, you know, rock climbing, skin diving, we do whatever we want to do, you know, it's... We're happy. I'm happy when I'm doing that. I'm happy when I'm playing my computer games. I'm happy when I'm... But that's not what happiness was to our founding fathers. They said living a life of moral virtue and character and involves patience, endurance, and suffering. True happiness. True happiness. I mean, who, who would sign up today for that and say, would you like to be happy? How about some patience, endurance, and suffering? <laughs> but isn't that what it's really all about? Because we're building character. We're becoming more Christ-like. And you talk to people that have done that, people that have gone out in the mission field, that experience this kind of stuff, and there's a joy in them. Because, and I was talking to Randy um, after the first service, and I said, "We've, you know, the founding fathers, William Bradford wrote in his his journal, uh, uh, Plymouth Plantation, William Bradford, second governor of, of Plymouth Colony. And those people lived and experienced the providence of God. It was amazing. When you read his, how, what he wrote in there, events that would happen, there would, I mean, there were direct correlation to what was going on in that community, and then there would be a drought. It was like the book of Judges. They would come back, they would fast, they would pray, and then there'd be rain. And not just rain, but it would be the perfect amount of rain. If they got too much rain, it would ruin the crops. But they'd get the perfect amount of rain. They'd start to spread. People would move out and move away. And God wasn't ready for them to do that. So he brought Indian attacks, and, and then pff, everybody come together, fast, pray, Indians go away. I mean, you read that book, it's amazing. They experienced the providence of God, providence of God uh, continually. But we, because they experienced the suffering, they experienced hardship. And they, every day, I mean, it's like now, it's like, honey, we're out of milk. Okay, I'll run to the store, you know. But when you lived in those times, you spent your day surviving. I mean, you had to get your food, build your shelter. There wasn't time for games, you know. We have, we're so entertainment-oriented, it's not even funny. But these people really knew what it was to live with God. And we may be experiencing that in the not-too-distant future. 
But then what about freedom? Nowadays, freedom is license. It means I'm free to do whatever I want, you know. I can be whoever I want. I don't want to be a man today. I want to be a woman today. And maybe I'll be something in between. Maybe I'll be a man that dresses like a woman or a woman that, I don't know. It's crazy. But it's not what freedom is. Freedom is the power to do what we ought to do. We're freed from the bondage of sin. It's not about us. It's about what do we do as a child of God? What am I supposed to do? I am not in bondage to sin anymore. I don't have to go and get drunk and do all that stuff. There's a better life for me. There's real happiness. There's real peace. There's, there's a really good life. You know, when I became a Christian, uh, drinking was a big part of my life. I was in a college culture, and, and I used to have a bottle of Jack Daniels in my dorm room, and I would come home. I had a friend who was uh, Irish Boston descent, and he had a bottle of Bushmills in his, and we'd come home from school and drink a shot and go up to the cafeteria. I mean, it's like, and, you know, so drinking was a big part of my life. And I remember when I became a Christian, I, uh, uh, I was working as a marine biologist, and we had a lab, and then we would, on Fridays, it just became like you'd close up shop, and then we'd have some, you know, party or whatever at the lab. And there was a game called Poker Dice, and you these dice that had poker hands on them. And then, you you know, if you, I don't remember if you won or you lost, but anyway, you drank. All you did is you drank shots. And, and I, after I was a Christian, I was like, Lord, you know, they were all talking about this. Oh, yeah, let's play that today. You know? And I'm sitting there praying, go, Lord, I can't do that. But I love that game. <laughs> and I went outside the lab and I prayed, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And I went back in and they were saying, okay, Rich, you love this game. Come on, let's play. And I, I had no desire to play that game. And I was like, no, I'm out. You count me on them. I don't want to play. And that was kind of the And I think one other time it was like a Super Bowl came up. I was married and I wasn't even around my college friends that much anymore. But it was a Super Bowl. And so, you know, and I was a Christian then and I decided I'm going to go out get some hot dog, get some beer, and I'm going to watch the Super Bowl. I had like half a beer, and I was like, what am I doing? (laughs) So, I mean, we change. Because we have something better. I don't need that. If you have to have that to have a good life, I'm sorry, that's... But it's not until you break away from it that you realize. I, one of my big fears about becoming a Christian is I was going to lose my friends. But one of the guys I was working with at the marine biology lab was a big influence on my becoming a Christian. He was a Christian and very gentle spirit. And he would talk to me. If he didn't know the answers, then he would just say, I'm sorry, Rich, but I'll see if I can find out an answer for you. But one of the things I said to him, I said, well, yeah, boy, if I become a Christian, I would lose all my friends. And he goes, if that's what would cause them to leave you as a friend, are they really your friends? I thought about that. I go, wow, why, if I became a Buddhist, they wouldn't leave me. Because that doesn't, that doesn't convict them. That's another one of those, well, eh, it may be true for you true for me, but Buddhists drink, right? Can they drink? Let's go drink. I mean, but you become a Christian, and it did happen. My best friend that I used to drink shots with, and he'd go scuba diving all the time. It was like, you're what? You're a Christian? Oh, gee. And no, it's Jesus. <laughs> okay? Didn't want anything to do with me after that. But you know what? It didn't bother me. So we get confused. I mean, this world has turned everything around. What good life, happiness, freedom are now is not what it was intended to be. 
And so I want to end on a, read you some quotes. Um, there's a Robert Charles Winthrop from 1809 to 1894. He is an American legislator, author, orator, was a descendant of Governor John Winthrop, who was the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And on May 28, 1849, Robert Charles Winthrop spoke at the annual meeting of the Massachusetts Bible Society. And this is what he said. He said, the voice of experience... <clears throat> And the voice of our own reason speak but one language. Both united in teaching us, men may as well build their house upon the sand and expect to see them stand when the rain falls and the winds blow and the floods come as to found free institutions upon any other basis than that of morality and virtue of which the word of God is the only authoritative rule and the only adequate sanction. All societies of men must be governed in some way or other. The less they have of stringent state government, the more they must have of individual self-government. The less they rely on public law or physical force, the more they must rely on private moral restraint. Men, in a word, must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them or a power without them. Either by the word of God or the strong arm of man, either by the Bible or the bayonet. It may do for other countries and other governments to talk about state supporting religion. Here under our own free institutions, it is religion must support the state so what is he saying? I mean, here you see a guy with a clear view of human nature, our human nature. We're either governed by our own moral convictions, our own being responsible for ourselves and those around us. If that's the case, we don't need a big government telling us what to do. That's why our Constitution is so small. You didn't need a big document explaining everything everybody has to do. That's why these founding fathers, so many of the founding fathers belong to Bible societies because they were trying to print Bibles and get them in the hands of the citizens. Because if people know how to govern their own personal life, they don't need a government telling them how to run their lives. But this is, again, totally turned around now. People are irresponsible and so now government is growing, trying to tell people how to live every facet of their life. And we see this in biblical worldview. We're just like, whoa, I see what's going on. And then let me, um, just a couple more quotes. But these are from Noah Webster. Noah Webster is uh, he wrote the first American Dictionary, uh, 1829. You can, um, when we were homeschooling, we bought one, you can get them. And it's, it's amazing, because you know, words change over time. It's like, uh, like the word gentleman. Okay, the word gentleman originally just had to do with somebody that was a landowner. If you owned land, you were a gentleman. You could be the rudest, crudest, most obnoxious person on earth, but you were a gentleman because you owned land. But the thing is that, generally speaking, if you were a landowner, you exhibited certain civilized qualities. So then it became, later on, you didn't have to own land, you'd be called a gentleman because you exhibited those same qualities. So you have to, when you read stuff and it's like, well, this is in the past, and you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense, then you have to look at the word. What did that word mean back then? in the 1829 Dictionary of Noah Webster, it's kind of handy when you, when you think, well, they say this about our founding fathers, but what did that word mean back then? Because they do change, okay? So Noah Webster is probably one of the most brilliant Americans at, at you know, 
I don't know, maybe even still, but I mean, he was a pretty brilliant guy. Anyway, he says, uh, every civil government is based upon some religion or philosophy of life, worldview. Education in a nation will propagate the religion of that nation. In America, the foundational religion was Christianity, and it was sown in the hearts of Americans through the home and private and public schools for centuries. Our liberty, growth, prosperity was a result of biblical philosophy of life. Our continued freedom and success is dependent on our educating the youth of America in the principles of Christianity. But what has happened? We have taken God out of the schools. We're teaching kids that they're nothing but animals, that it's up to them to to make up their own morals, their own values. It has never worked in the past. And it's not going to work here. Why are there shootings in schools? There's no wonder. So we're teaching them to. And lastly, last from Noah Webster, is the principles of all genuine liberty and wise laws and administrations are to be drawn from the Bible and sustained by its authority. The man, therefore, who weakens or destroys the divine authority of that book may be accessory to all the public disorders which society is doomed to suffer. And I hope they are held accountable, but I would rather they change. So our worldview is a biblical worldview. You're, you have to get yourself into the Word of God and in prayer because there are troubled times ahead. I mean, when I first became a Christian, and I was going to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, it was back in the late 70s, early 80s. And I was taking, they had classes you could take, you know. And I remember taking like an eschatology class. We were talking about end times and going through all the prophecies in the Bible. And I was like, well, come on. I mean, I said all these nations are going to attack Israel. I mean, most of those nations are friendly towards Israel. I mean, Turkey and Egypt, I mean... Okay, they're not like all buds and everything, but I mean, they're like, you know, they seem to get along okay. doesn't seem to be like anybody's like in a big hurry to attack Israel or anything. And besides, America, what do you mean America's not mentioned? How could we not be mentioned? We're like really tight with Israel. You know, get all, you know we're all pro-Israel here at church and all that. But now, a long time, but now I'm looking at what's going on over there. And I'm go, wow, you know, all these nations have turned like this in a couple of years. The Muslim Brotherhood, ISIS, wow. And then what's going on in Gaza? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here in this country, but really as Christians, we need to be focused. We, have, we need to keep one of our worldview eyes focused over there because that's really where it all starts, you know. <laughs> I mean, the lawlessness and everything that we see here is just a sign. You know, it's the way the Romans went. It's the way the Greeks went. We're heading that way too. But this affects, okay? Remember, we still have the ability to vote. We still have a chance for change. But you need to get your worldview lined up. You get, you, he says this is how we live and move and have our being. Let the, that biblical worldview affect the way you address these things. And who knows? Maybe there's time to change. Maybe this really isn't the time. Maybe we can turn America around. Why give up? It's not, not who we are. God didn't put us here to just give up. I think there are Christians out there that say, well, that's just the way it's supposed to be. We don't get involved in politics, and that's, if it's happening, then that's God's sovereignty, and that's the way he wants it, and I just don't believe that. So I think we can still make a difference.